Romans chapter 14. And so Victor is going to translate for me. And for our, our special Ukrainian friends. And uh, I will try to keep it simple so you can enjoy the Bible. And we are, we are studying and learning about how to be a Christian family. How we spend time together and life together. Today we are learning about how to protect each other. Especially if we share different opinions traditions and experiences from faith backgrounds or maybe even convictions in our hearts. Sometimes convictions can be very strong and uh, opinions can be very strong. And other times uh, different groups of people uh, can uh, uh, say, no, you have to be free and practice liberty and do whatever you want because God's grace allows you to do whatever you want. And so you get a picture like this, where you have a family that is pulling at times the cord and there is tension like we have on the screen. That was happening in the city of Rome 2000 years ago in the church where Paul was writing to them, the Romans. They were pulling against each other. They were dividing the church over their traditions, their opinions. And so they needed to know the grace of God, how to care for each other. So we talked about how, you, how they ate together, because that was one of the problems, was food. Then we talked afterward, we talked about uh, how they tolerated each other. Last week, the message was toward the group that had very strong opinions and very strong religious traditions. They were people who had come from Israel, so they were Jews, who had converted to Jesus. And so they wanted to follow the Old Testament law of Moses here, and they also wanted to follow Jesus. But they were insistent. They were driving the other believers who were the Roman believers, the Gentiles who lived there. And they were demanding that they follow the same rules or they couldn't have grace. They thought that they were strong and they had the Bible on their side. Paul says that they were actually weak because they didn't have grace on their side. But today in these verses, in this part of this, of this letter that Paul writes, today he's going to speak to the strong group. These are strong people because they have the power and they have the privilege because it was their home. It was their language. It was their church. They had the houses. They had the business. And they were the leaders. It, it was their place. It was where they lived. So they were the, they were the strong ones. They also didn't have so many laws and rules like the Jews had many rules. So they were strong in grace. So how are we doing, Victor? Are we okay? Am I going too fast? It's okay. Okay, just checking. They didn't have so many rules because they lived by grace. And many of them were upset that these other believers came with such strong opinions and started to call them idolaters and started to insist that they do the same traditions. And so they had two groups between the weaker ones who were the foreigners and, and religious observers and the strong group of who were the Romans who had all their houses and homes. They were, they were wealthier and they had more freedom. Today, he talks to the stronger group who had more liberty and they were using it to be too strong. They were using it too much in their liberty. Let me share a few things that we've been going through over the last few weeks to start. Paul wants us first to build each other up in the family of God, both the weak and the strong, 
in love for one another and then reach out and invite others in. In other words, you can't invite somebody to the family of God, having a culture and a community of God, if it's not a welcome of God in the community, if there's nothing about God in it, if the community's arguing, if there's tension, if there's fighting, you can go anywhere and find that. But you have to come in the family of God and find a family that gives you a taste of heaven before we actually go there. And that's what he wants us to do. Build the family and then re reach out and show them. Come and see the family. Be in the family of God. This is what Christianity is. And that means care from the weak for the strong and grace from the strong to the weak. No matter where we are in our faith levels. The, I believe that God's call to us in Romans 14, God's saying, learn to be brothers and sisters in my family, because it's my family, and like it. You're going to like it, because I have so much grace for you as a family. All right? Don't live so that your opinions leave you to exclude others who speak differently from you, who look differently from you, who eat differently from you, and who come from different countries and places. Work hard to connect as God's family, no matter what level anybody is at, no matter how strong or weak they are. Because none of us is the gatekeeper. Do not condemn or exclude out whom God has brought in. So here's the profile of the problem. The profile, the problem that they had, especially for this passage that Paul is talking to them about is, Grace had not gone deep enough to, steep, to stop them from injuring each other over things that didn't need to be primary issues. They had taken secondary opinions and traditions, like denominational backgrounds, preferences, preferences in music and preferences in drinking and dress and, and practices and where you go and what you do and who you're with, all of those preferences, and they had made them primary. They said, you're not a true Christian if you don't do these things. And the Bible, and Paul says, no, you are, <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that. You aren't letting grace go deep enough because you're using your opinions or your liberty to hurt each other over things that are not central issues. Now, in the, in the verses we'll look at, Paul will show us that people are either too weak in their faith or too strong in their faith and they're in their liberty. And that both groups were wrong in some way. They were, they were making tension and dividing the church, but they were wrong in both of their opinions, but, or their positions, but they both thought that they were right. Each group was convinced it was right. Both of them were wrong. And Paul says, come back to grace and we'll show you what the family of God really is. That's what we're studying. Today, the strong in the church family, they were taking advantage. They had the power and they were taking advantage of the others who, with no power. They were tempting them to sin. They were injuring their consciences and their minds. They were causing them to stumble. They were ridiculing them and they were despising others with a sense of superiority. This is my country, this is my practice, this is the way we eat, this is what we do. In that day, their problem, their, their fights were over food. What food you could eat and who you could eat with. And one of the foods, you know that this church was in Rome and it was an Italian church because one of the main foods was prosciutto. And what was happening was the Romans at their special feasts 
were forcing and demanding that the Jewish believers coming, who would only eat kosher and no pork, that they would eat the prosciutto because they're in Italia. That's what they would say. And we still have that phrase today. Perché siamo in Italia. That means because we're in Italy. You have to eat what we're eating. You have to taste our food. And what was happening? The, the Jewish believers that weren't living by grace, they were scandalized in their heart. And they were getting angry at the, old, at the, at the mature believers, the, the, the stronger believers, that were the Romans, for forcing them to eat something that they felt was dishonoring to God. We don't have that same issue today. We don't. But we have other issues that, that can easily divide us. Okay? And so Paul is going to touch on this about how you can be too strong in your behavior and in your opinions. Even though you might have a correct position, you can still hurt somebody. And that's not protecting each other. So protection is a family practice, right? When you're getting bullied on the playground until your big brother shows up. <laughs> Then it stops. You just need somebody bigger or until mom or dad shows up. There's a protection that takes place in the family from the stronger to the weak. Watch. In all the messages that we've been giving in Romans 13 and 14, usually everybody listening to these messages thinks we are the strong. I'm, I'm part of the strong group. So all the way up to this message, many of you have felt this isn't for me. But now I'm at the strong message. So if you felt that way, this one's for you, okay? This is speaking directly to you. If you feel you have a strong and mature faith, all right, listen in. You have to take the first step. Paul says it is the first step of the mature, of those who understand grace, to care for the weak, not to force something on somebody with a more sensitive conscience in their lives, okay? And this is the first principle. He's, he gives four guidelines today. First one is take away the stumbling blocks. Watch the path of the younger ones. Just like if you were out on a walk. If you have young ones who could easily trip, don't put something in front of them and push them over it. Don't make somebody to fall and to trip. And protection requires this. Four things that it requires. Let's look at the verse. Verse 13 of Romans 14 says, Therefore, let us not condemn each other. Past judgment. Let's not do this any longer. We have to make a direct decision on what that would be. Don't ever put a stumbling block. Decide it in your mind. If you're going to be convinced, don't be convinced that you are going to fight for your right position. Instead, be convinced that you will not trip somebody up with a stumbling block. Don't put a hindrance in front of somebody who is still learning to walk in their Christian life. In the message, in the verses, I have underlined the words to emphasize, Paul, emphasize Paul's language that's hurting language or destruction language or power language, where somebody who has more power, position, and privilege is using that to take advantage of, of the weaker people in a church. And you'll see all of his language. Don't grieve, don't hinder, don't trip, don't push, don't scandalize. It's all in, it's all in here. This is, for, this is for those. We all want to have a mature faith. But it might be that we, and a strong faith, but it might be that we go too strong. Uh, and so he says to make sure to protect each other as we go. Don't put a stumbling block in the way, a hindrance of a brother. In other words, don't plan things that would, that would demand either that, that they be tempted by what you're doing to do it and fall into sin themselves or that they're not convinced yet. If there's another brother or sister that's not convinced yet, don't force that. It's similar to, let's, let's bring up an issue that comes up often about drinking, okay? And, and social drinking. 
there will be, uh, throughout the years, there will be people who will say, you know what, I'm free to do that. And there will be other Christians who will come, and you'll come from a strong faith tradition and background that says, no, I'm not free to do that. And so you abstain. And sometimes, some Christians are scandalized seeing others who might not, ab who might not abstain from drinking. And this comes up every so often. I'm just giving an, an idea, an example as we go. Something practical. You can insert your own thing whenever it comes up and you're tempted to say, well, that's their problem. They just need to grow up and suck it up. You know, as soon as you get to that, that area. Sorry, Victor, that won't translate. But as soon as you get to that area and you feel that feeling, well, then you got you to gotta pull back and insert the issue. So if you know someone from another culture or somebody else might be scandalized by that, you ask and find out, where are you? Is this okay? And if they say, I, I don't like that, well, then that means that they're still growing in faith and maybe there's not an aspect of, uh, uh, of, of allowing of grace for you to do it. Don't take it. Don't, put, don't do an action that causes somebody to reduce or to criticize what you're doing, which you have every right to do. And you might say, well, I have my rights. You do, but not at the cost of their hearts. You see? Does that make sense? Not at the cost through the behavior of what you do for their lives. This is Christian love, tenderness, and protection. So that's number one. Everybody got it? Remove the stumbling blocks. In other words, if, you're, if you think you're a strong person, and you have your rights, it will keep you from looking around at the problems it might cause in what you do. You'll become egocentric. You'll become a self-centered person, and you won't be tender for those who are still growing. And our Christian family, we need people who are tender at all levels, no matter what faith level we are as we're growing. Everybody got it? Somebody, let me hear a rattle because, you know, I can't see, you're, I only see half your faces again. I need, help me with feedback. Your lunch depends on it. Number two, protection requires walking in love. If we're going to protect our family, we must walk in love. Look at, look at this verse, how he, how he phrases it. He says, here's my conclusion, my working conclusion. I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Here's Paul. I'm convinced the food issue is a non-issue. Jesus made it a non-issue in Mark 6. God made it a non-issue in Acts 10 when he brought the animals down and Peter's on the roof, right? And he says, kill, grill, and eat. That's what he told Peter to do. And then go into the Gentile, the, the commander, Colonel Cornelius's house of the Roman guard, which Peter had never been in the Gentile's house and ate together with him. He says, everything is, everything's clean, but to the person it is unclean, and he thinks it's unclean, it is unclean for them. So here I am, I'm persuaded, I have grace, and I am going to give patience and tolerance for that person. I am not going to insist, demand, uh, or, uh, or promote a certain position over the top of his position. Because his heart's not in the same place my heart is. My conviction and heart are not in the same place. But that's okay. Paul says there's still room in the family of God to love each other. Here's why. For if your brother sees you eating or drinking and is grieved, you are no longer walking in love. You are risking to exclude people from the family of God, especially at the table. What is he saying? The Christian family needs to be the kind of family that is so unique, so much, if you will, sacrificial love. Walking in love means giving yourself away. It means that you are consuming the other brother. Instead, he says the Christian family needs to be one that is so unique, it gives itself away. So when new people come in, they see a community and they say, I've never experienced a people like this before in my life. Because we're a heavenly people walking on earth. That's how God works. Watch. By what you eat, 
do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Look at the comparison he's making. You might come in and say, but I have my rights. I can do this, and they just need to grow up. They just need to deal with it. But he's saying, do you see your behavior? You're taking such a small thing that you say you want to do, and you're destroying, you're dismantling the person who is growing that Jesus died for, and he gave his whole life, body, blood, and spirit for them. There is no comparison. You're taking something to consume. He gave himself away so that they could live. Why would you undo the work of love that Jesus did for them? They can't see Jesus' love through that attitude and through that action. Okay? That's not walking in love. Walking in love is taking steps like Jesus that sacrifice for others in the way of the cross. And they point to what Jesus did. Our lives will become Jesus formed. We will do what Jesus did when we're truly walking in love. And that is being truly strong. In verse 15, he's saying, in verse 14, there's the position. That's the strong position. Everything is clean. But look in verse 15. You can take a strong position too far and be too strong. You can say, it's clean and I can do it. Therefore, I will do it. And your behavior will destroy somebody else. Not only did you have the strong position, you took too strong of a position and you used it to hurt somebody else. Do you see? That's how we can easily fall into that temptation of not protecting others. This is what it means to be right. To be right is to love. Usually strong people say, I'm right and I know I'm right. Paul said, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded. But then he says, here's what it means to be right. It means to walk in love. If you don't care for other brothers and sisters by what you do, you're just not right. You think you're strong, but you're actually weak all over again. And you flip the cycle. <laughs> what is Christian freedom? We use the word freedom a lot, especially in the second service. <laughs> what is Christian freedom, though? It, it, freedom is not being able just to go out and do whatever I want at the cost of others' lives. We often say, I need to express myself. So I'm going to say anything. I'm going to write anything. I'm going to post anything. I need, I have, I have freedom of speech. I need to express myself. Anytime you say you have a need to do something, it's not a freedom. You're enslaved. <laughs> and so therefore, by what I say... And what I post, I can injure with my freedom. You are, you're right. You have freedom. You have a freedom of speech. But when you have Christ, not at the cost of someone else. I got to be who I am. Why don't you be who Christ wants you to be? You know, and keep that other stuff to yourself. You see, <laughs> I have to be who I am. Yes, to a certain extent, that's, that's true. But not at the expense and the hurt of someone else. Because that's a sinful practice. And the Lord wants to change that. He wants us to be the kind of family where there is love abounding at all faith levels. Number two, Christian freedom is not more concerned about whether you can do something than whether you should do something. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you're working so hard to try to find, to see if you can, you actually can do, if you're saying, I can do this, I can do this, it's taking away your time from concentrating and looking at others and saying, should I do this? I can, and you may be right. But the question is not whether you can, it's about whether you should. Look at the people God has given you around you to love and to serve, and that will tell you whether you should, should do something or not. What impact will it have in their life? Will it help them grow, or will it hurt them? Number three, freedom is not what you can do, but what you don't have to do to be able to love another person. Let's go back to that drinking thing, okay? If you come to the table and you say, oh man, I can drink, therefore I will, I have to have that, 
whether they, what they think about me or not, because I just like it so much with my meal, whatever it might be, the occasion, well then, at that point, that's not freedom. That's allowing a thing to guide your appetite to hurt another brother or sister. And we have to be careful about that. You see, you're not free. Freedom is not about what I can do, but about what I don't have to do. And that at a time when I'm looking at my brother and sister, I could go, no, I'm, not, I'm gonna set that down. I'll just take water, whatever it is, and I'm going to abstain so that my brother and sister aren't scandalized. Why? That's using Christian freedom to protect brothers and sisters. Three things that freedom is not to help us know what freedom is, okay? Number three, Paul says you have to practice, protection requires healthy bodybuilding, okay? So I've worked hard to try to model this, so follow me as I follow Christ. Does, all right, good, you believe me. That wasn't a joke, I'm serious. Okay, healthy bodybuilding, body capitalized, meaning Christian bodybuilding. Here it goes, look, so, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. In other words, the way that you portray each other in your testimony, here it is something that is good and fine, but if your behavior is off, if it hurts another brother, they will look at you and say, that person is evil, and it turns the whole body of Christ upside down. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy. That's one unit, all in the Holy Spirit. So here's what he's saying. The kingdom of God is not about asserting your rights. I can eat meat offered to idols from, bought from the market. I can drink what I want to drink and when I want to drink it. That's what the Gentile believers were saying. I can do what I want. I'm asserting my rights. He says, it's not about running around asserting your rights. Eating and drinking and partying like you would like. Even though you might be free to do that. But rather, when people come together in the community, the kingdom of God will be present because that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. And you will sense God's presence because all three things will be together. Righteous actions, joy from the heart, and peace between Gentiles and Jews. <laughs> peace between different nationalities. That is the mark of a Christian community where you cannot get righteousness, joy, and peace anywhere else. It's about what we represent in the kingdom together. And many of you have said to me, I have experienced community here like I've never experienced before. This morning, I just got a letter from Chris and Mary Beth. How many remember Chris and Mary Beth? The reverse, the that's right. They were out there in Virginia, and they wrote this morning, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving our Ukrainian friends together. We wish so much that the Lord would allow us to help us serve you and care for our friends together, but we are praying for you. And they sent money, donation, to pay for the meals for our friends, and they said, please serve Jesus. We wish we were there with you. We haven't experienced community like Serenissima yet or <laughs> before. Jenna, you told me that this week. How many beautiful things are coming together? We haven't experienced community like this ever before. Praise God for that. There's a sense of family evangelism. And we hear from people all over the world all the time. It is righteousness, peace, and joy together in the presence of God. That's how we know if we're a spirit-born people. Be careful. People will often equate their feelings with the Holy Spirit and say, that's what I feel, so I must be guided. No, no, no. If you have joy, you will also have righteousness, if it's truly the Holy Spirit. If you have peace, you also have joy, you see. You also have righteousness and peace. They all go together and will be evidence in action, word, and practice, and heart. Whoever acts like this serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. God loves it and others experience it. This is what the Christian family does. God loves that we love each other. And then 
other men and women say that is an attractive family to be a part of. It's worth being in God's kingdom and God's family. So Paul says, let's go hunting. That's the word pursue. Let's chase after the things that make for peace and bodybuilding, mutual up building. What does he say? Let me say it like this. So here's Tom, brother Tom, wait real high. There's Tom. If I am in the presence of Tom and I'm like talking with him and I'm saying, Tom, you're always, you're always kind, generous, good looking guy. I think you're uh, trying to get something. Yeah, yeah, he thinks I'm trying to get something from him. <laughs> or if I say, uh, and I'm, I'm with him and I'm talking about his family and his experience and I get to know him, but Tom says something I don't like. And I just go away from that conversation and I go over here to my daughter, Jessie, and I say, you know that Mr. Tom over there, he's a real weirdo, very awkward. And I didn't like this and that. You see what's happening? <laughs> you see what's happening? I'm exercising different gifts. No, <laughs> what's happening is outside of his presence, I'm talking about him and I'm breaking down who God had saved and built up. You see, when I'm with Jesse, then I need to be saying, you know the quality of Jesus that I saw in Mr. Tom and in his family and Deanna and the, and the children? These are the kind of things that when we're away from each other, we need to be bodybuilding by speaking well of each other, not of each other's opinions. That's my challenge. Be bodybuilders. Ura, yeah? You with me? Aura, as we say, or as they say in the Marines, at least. <laughs> Be bodybuilders. In other words, always speak well of the qualities of Jesus, of peace, joy, and love, because we are seeking what makes for peace. Gossip is cancer to a church and church family. Let's avoid that. Number four, protection requires a faith level comprehension. What I mean is we have to comprehend where everybody is at in their level of faith. Some are growing, some convictions are strong and settled. Some are learning new things. Some have had more experience in the faith. It's different levels, but we're all in that family of Christ. So look what Paul says, do not destroy for the sake of food, the work of God. Everything is indeed clean but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Yes, you have your rights and your position, and it is wrong, though, to use it to hurt someone else. That's what we've been emphasizing the message in this message. It is good not to, here's it, here it is. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to be hurt in their hearts. The stumble can also be tempted to also sin because they haven't developed maybe an area of maturity in their own hearts and grace yet. The faith that you have, if you're convinced and it's okay, if that's your faith, keep it to yourself. <laughs> this is Paul just saying, you don't have to express it. You don't have to say everything you think. You don't have to be a right fighter all the time. Just keep it between yourself and God. Go to him and let him affirm how right you are. And you'll be humbled. Don't worry. Blessed. This is happy. This really means fulfilled. Blessed is the person who has no reason to condemn himself by what he eats or what he approves or what he doesn't approve. Meaning, blessed, happy is a person who understands how grace applies in all the situations. They're happy. They're free. But they don't need to express it. Just... Shut up. <laughs> Give it to yourself. Love others and, and, and go forward. Encourage them. But whoever is wavering and has doubts and struggles, he is condemned. He's self-condemned because his grace and his convictions haven't allowed him to love God properly. They've dishonored God. His eating is not from convinced faith before the Lord. For whatever does not proceed from convinced biblical faith is not from God, as Paul makes this. So 
We all want to be a whole person. But if we're not practicing from a convinced faith, then we're going to hurt others. And protection of others is actually, protection and care of others is to become a whole, strong, and integral person. By caring for somebody, we become stronger. That's how it works. We are the body of Jesus. We become the best human being that God made us ever. <laughs> Caring for others makes us whole. That's what he's saying here. You're not scandalizing people's hearts and consciences. So let's close with this. Six signs of if our faith, to cover all of chapter 14, real quick. Six signs if our faith is either too weak or too strong. If we're being too opinionated, too condemning, right? Too judgmental on one side or promoting too much liberty at the expense of someone else. Here we are. If at the end of your position, your opinion, your practice, you exclude others from social gatherings, eating with each other, going out together, taking trips together, or you treat others as kind of second-class citizens or people that aren't in your peer group with less or no value. That's how you know if you're too weak or too strong in this way. In the end, they're not with you. They're excluded because you found some reason to exclude them. All right, so far so good? All right, number two. We have less grace inside of our hearts and we have more judgment or criticism inside of our hearts at the end of our position. We're more angry or frustrated with brothers and sisters than we have grace of Jesus to go, I'm learning with brothers and sisters. Number three, we're too weak or we're too strong when we aren't taking steps like Jesus took when he showed his love toward others. And this is living out the gospel. What did Jesus do? He was the all-powerful one. He descended. He walked and showed us the steps of how to give himself away. He did for us what we could not do. He died, rose again, ascended, and governs our church family today from heaven. This is the love of Jesus. What we do toward our brothers and sisters will also look like that. It will have a Jesus descending and ascending form to it. That's living the gospel. Okay? So evaluate with the biblical data, evaluate your faith, and your practice to see if it looks like the gospel. Number four, we're too weak or we're too strong if we, haven't, we have strong opinions and strong positions, but we haven't studied it deeply yet in the scriptures and with other brothers and sisters, if we haven't talked it out yet. That will tell us that our opinions might not yet be strong enough or we might be coming too strong over someone. Another sign is that we are forgetting, we forget who we are. All of us are saved by grace, aren't we? We were all dead and the Lord brought us to life and grow, is growing us from weak to strong. And we then we forget who the other people are in our church and they are family members of Jesus's family. And that's so important. We forget where we've been and where they've been and who they are. So every person we see needs to have a big cross, this big cross behind them. By the way, this cross was here when Ed and Dinah were here originally all those years ago. We got this at our first year. So this is 24 years old. This is wonderful. Imagine that big cross behind every believer. And then you are either too weak or too strong because instead of discipling and walking with others, you're criticizing and you're actually undiscipling them. Jesus is growing them by faith and you're coming along and you're expressing opinions or hurting them and it's actually dismantling all the work that God has done. You're having them to go backwards in their faith. And um, you're, not the, you're not the antichrist, but you become the anti-disciplers of Christ, you see? And so you're just going the opposite direction of where Jesus goes. You're not helping with them. All right, does that make sense? So let's remember this. Remember the image of grace of what the Lord Jesus did. He came down and came into our mess and sat at the table to receive us. He was the strong one. We were the dead and weak ones. He came down in all of our mess and all of our failures. And he said, welcome to my table. Let me serve you. 
and now go and treat each other like that. And we do that by protecting each other in grace. And so today, we're going to take these elements and receive from the all-powerful one, the one with status and position and privilege, the love that he gave to us through the Lord's Supper. And when we receive in this next couple minutes, this Lord's Supper, these elements, we're going to not only give thanks to him for that, but we're going to give thanks for each other and pray for each other and protect each other. So let's make sure that we confess any sin of where maybe we've come too strong. Let's be sure that we confess anything where we've disregarded someone else, where we've done things to trip someone up or hurt someone because we wanted to defend our own positions. Um, maybe we've even criticized them or made them less in our own minds and hearts. And let's get that grace filled back up in our heart to protect each other as we do. Would you bow your heads now? And close your eyes as we come to this Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, now we want to reflect and take a moment to analyze our hearts. We want to give grace to others in our hearts, but we want to also confess where we, being forgiven of so much by you, have refused to maybe forgive somebody else. Or maybe we've tried to just one-up somebody or compete with them or cut them down to make ourselves feel better or bigger. And in this way, Lord, we have dishonored the body of Christ. You came and gave your life away to make us whole. You came to practice a family outreach, a family uh, protection, a way that the people of God can have refuge with and for each other. Lord, please convict us where we haven't protected our brothers and sisters. Maybe we haven't prayed for them. Maybe we have snapped at them, been irritable. Maybe we've talked about them. Maybe we haven't even cared. We've just been indifferent. We don't know what they're going through and we couldn't care what they're going through. Father, this is a sin because you've put us in the family and you've called us to love each other, to help us to take stumbling blocks away. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, make our family whole, that we might live for you and serve others. In your name, I pray.